this with I guess you just so you plastics. Exactly how do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. founder of uh, Ocean Recovery Alliance and the co-founder of Project Kaisei. This photo here today sort of represents why I'm here. Um, it's not really because of the red headband representing the death of the ecology that's coming in front of us, but it's about my background growing up in California, um, exposed to a lot of sports, a lot of outdoors, camping. And I think that exposure at an early age is very, very important. It's um, sad to see in cities like this where there's cement everywhere that the youth don't have an exposure and touch point to nature and the environment. And if they don't have that today, when they're growing up, it's very hard for them to get that in the future, to have something in their heart that says, I need to protect that. If you're a parent and your kids don't have that touch with nature early on, it's like neutering the kids from nature in the future. And so today, I had that luckily in my background. Um, I've worked in a number of industries here and uh, been out on the water a lot, I see plastic all the time. <clears throat> then I heard about this thing called the plastic vortex, this thing in the middle of the ocean. I said, where's this, how come no one is even talking about this? I, I know about environmental things, but I'd never heard about this before. And what really kicked me over after that was I was diving in Palau, middle of the ocean, in the outer reef, and 20 meters below the water, there's this rainfall of plastic. And I was picking it, putting it in my dive thing, and I said, what is this? I mean, who is doing something? How can we do this? So Dustin Hoffman, 45 years ago, was told the future is plastic. And today we realize that the future is not so great, at least in terms of this. This material has been aggregating in our daily lives without us noticing it. It's lightweight, cheap to use, but it's durable. It does not go away. 50% of all the plastic used today on the planet roughly is for disposable products. Use a coffee stirrer, a, a lid for the coffee, some in your salad bowl. That thing will last 400 years. 90% of all plastic made today does not get recycled, even if it has a nice little recycling triangle on the bottom and you feel good about using something that's recycled. The infrastructure does not exist to keep waste management and recycling and get that into the right place. So you throw it into the bin and unfortunately a lot of it doesn't get used as a recycled material. This is restored energy plastic. And the beauty, in a way, the opportunity here is that plastic, 90% of it's not getting reused, it's a big opportunity. There's all kinds of things we can do with technology in turning this into something that is now usable. So two years ago we went out with Project Kaisei and Scripps Oceanography into a place called the North Pacific Gyre. It's the most remote sit, uh, ecosystem on the planet. It takes three to four days to get there. You could fly to the Antarctic in 24 hours if you wanted. This is uh, northeast of Hawaii. It's not on the shipping channel. It's not where the sailboats go, and therefore people don't really know that it's there. 80% roughly of all the trash that comes from uh, into the ocean is actually from us um, on land. And 70% of what goes out there actually sinks. So what we're looking for is the stuff that is floating in this area. There's five of these in the world where you have ocean, uh, ocean currents and unfortunately plastic is one of those things that doesn't really biodegrade and it doesn't really go away and it floats. So this floating stuff is out here in the middle. So we went out, did a, all kinds of science on two research vessels and we're looking at toxicity, we're looking at the types of plastic, maybe where it's coming from, what is the impact on wildlife. Um, Ocean Conservancy says that 270 different species on the planet get impacted by wildlife. That's oceanic-related species, bird and wildlife. We were the first group to uh, 
do trolling down at 700 meters. Um, when you think about ocean, seven, it's two-thirds of our planet. Um, there's no body count for animals when they die in the ocean. How do we know if something gets stuck with plastic in them and he drops to the bottom and someone eats it? We don't know, really, what has been going on in the last 50 years. Now when you study a whale when it's been beached, we used to not cut it open and do an autopsy to see if there's plastic. We'd bury it. Now all the whales, when you're looking at them, have tens of kilos of stuff inside that is not natural. Fishing nets, bags, because when they use sonar, they think, wow, there's a squid. I can eat that. So we went out. This is actually from Bali, sadly, uh, when we were diving in a national park, and this big swath of plastic came out of nowhere. And, um, you know, the point is that this is stuff is everywhere, and we actually can make a difference. We were one of the first groups to do deep water testing, and that was just to get water samples, nothing else. Each one of those canisters is 10 liters in size. And by accident, 10 liters, the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we got a piece of plastic at 200 meters deep, and we got one at 160 meters deep. So all of a sudden now there's this three-dimensionality uh, thought when we were before we were just surface trolling. We did surface trolls on 3,500 miles of water in that one-month period, and in every single sample we got plastic. So it wasn't as if we were out looking for a tiger and we find a footprint and, oh, there's a tiger somewhere. We found this everywhere we went, and it's because it's been building up in our society. Plastic in the ocean has a problem. It also aggregates pesticides and heavy um, pollutants. It's like a magnet. So the theory is that when the fish eat these plastic, the plastic might not kill the little fish, but will go through. The fatty tissue in the fish sucks the toxins off. Plastic goes out, toxins in the fish you get biomagnification right up into the food chain. Our scientists just about a month ago, after two years, published a study on the fish that we got, about five centimeters these fish are, they're not big ones, living from depths all the way up. We found that 10% of all the fish had plastic in them. When you take the biomass of what the fish would be in that area of the ocean, their calculations showed that these little fish in one year would be eating 12 to 24,000 tons of plastic every year. And that then probably can do something um, into our food chain. This is a shot from 2.5 kilometers below the ocean. Um, I've seen a few of these recently. Cold water, high pressure, this stuff is not going to biodegrade or go away for decades, if not hundreds of years. So with this issue in mind, uh, what, did we, what are some of the solutions? Beach cleanups are good, but that's not really tackling the issue. So uh, we started Ocean Recovery Alliance and announced two projects last year at the Clinton Global Initiative. And what we're doing now is looking at a new way to bring um, the bigger community into this issue of the oceans, not just coastal. If you think about the world's coastlines, it's roughly 218,000 miles, okay, you go down the coast. So imagine here you are in a classroom and the teacher says, hey, Chan, go up to that photo and go up to the wall and draw a line from Oregon down to San Diego. Don't take your pencil off the paper. So Chan goes up there, draws all the way down the coastline, and he says, yeah, I did it. The teacher says, wow, that's great. But you know what, actually, it's not quite what we're looking for. So Rosie raised her hand, Rosie gets up there and says, I can do it, I know where the coastline goes. So Rosie gets up there, just had a Red Bull, and she's up there and she takes that pencil and she draws the coastline. And the people say, oh my gosh, you're right. I went up one river bank and I came down the other. And that is the new coastline. So when you consider 20 of the world's largest rivers, and you calculate one river bank up, one river bank down, you get 80, 6,000 plus miles of new coastline. That's three and a half times around the world that we never thought of. If you really think about where this, all the tributaries and everything else that's feeding into the ocean, that is millions of miles. You think of the tributaries just like blood vessels going into the heart and the heart is the ocean. And you might as well think of plastic as cholesterol going through those veins into our heart. So what we're looking at now is building a whole global web platform that will be able to use citizen science and community reporting 
to have people monitor their rivers themselves. They can be river keepers. They can be citizen caretakers of that river. And we're just talking about floating debris. It's not other pollutants. So it's easy for kids, schools, anyone to get involved and post this onto this global map that's going to give alerts of where the hot spots are. When that happens, you bring awareness. You get governments interested, NGOs, corporate, schools, and you have um, all kinds of solutions. First is awareness. Then you have, wow, how do I capture it? How do I gather this stuff? This is in Melbourne. For 10 years, they've been doing this in the river running through the city. And it's just a pretty simple boom. But they have them all along the river, and it works. And I've told this to some people, and they say, wow, why don't we have one of those in our river? People just haven't thought about it, because plastic just kind of floats and goes away over there. And it's not my problem. Well, we're trying to show that there is a problem. There's an ecological problem. There's health issues. This stuff doesn't go away. How can we use this more effectively? So the next solution, that one's called the Global Ocean Alert System. This next project also is called uh, the Plastic Disclosure Project. And this is very similar to that of carbon disclosure, where companies would give annual reports of what their carbon is. So people now know about carbon footprints. Today, we want to talk about what is your plastic footprint. It doesn't have to be just for a company. It can be for institutions, universities. Unless you have a baseline and a metric to measure, you don't know really what you have. Some people say, wow, how do I measure my plastic? Well, how do you measure carbon? You can't see carbon. You can't touch it. Plastic, you can, it's here. A kid can tell you how many pieces you use. So what we're just trying to do is get people to look at and think, wow, how can I use this more efficiently? One of the first ways is just less waste. Okay, there's a huge amount of waste in the supply chain. Everything's shrink wrapped, and you know, then it gets thrown away, and then you put it on the shelf. Well, why are you shrink wrapping everything when it comes out of the factory? The next thing is more recycling. Why don't you have more recycling um, in your policy, in your group, in your community, with your constituents? Why don't you have more recycled content in your product? Consumers today are going to value that. They're going to say, wow, you guys are a leader because they've put in recycled, more recycled content in their products. That's a good story. Also, biodegradable material. We've got to move to the age of biodegradable material. Uh, of course, there's composting issues, but we're at stage one. We need to go to stage two, three, four, five, six. And then better design. Better design can be light weighting things, more reusability. And so that is um, the Plastic Disclosure Project, which we'll be running from Hong Kong. The next project, uh, which is something that is really more of a solution, but it's uh, plastic to fuel. It's a new technology coming around the world. There's more and more coming up. Very tricky to put all kinds of plastics, different melting points, into the same batch and come out with a product. And now there's one company in Hong Kong that can do this, and a few around the world that are just coming into the market. And for me, this is a huge potential solution, not just uh, for the any good recycling can taken out, but all the stuff that normally goes to landfill. So we did this project um, with eight schools in Hong Kong, and we had them kids collect the plastic. We ground it up, and we turn it into this product, which is diesel. It's fifty percent cleaner than marine diesel sold in Hong Kong. Fifty percent better sulfur content. Took the kids then out on a boat to see the pink dolphins uh, with the fuel that they collected from their plastic waste. And to me, this is a huge hope. We're now working on a project with a curriculum in the schools here that um, will be all about marine pollution and plastic. And once we build it here, we can digitize that and send it around the world in different languages. So we're using the big issue of the plastic vortex in the middle of the ocean to drive some of these big global projects that uh, we really think are tools that everyone's going to be able to use at a lot of different touch points. Um, so in that plastic to fuel example, three kilos of plastic becomes a one liter of diesel. Uh, the gas that is made in the side actually runs the plant. And so it can be off-grid and self-sufficient. So um, it's a very, very interesting new potential solution for uh, plastic. So as Sylvia Earle likes to say, um, famous oceanographer, if the ocean is not healthy, we're not healthy. And it really rings true. Two-thirds of our planet is the ocean. Um, we started um, 50 years ago. We went down, set a world record at the bottom of the ocean, going 11,000 meters. 1960, 
after that happened, Kennedy sent people to space. And we've always looked up ever since. And we've pretty much forgotten in the last 50 years what the ocean means to our planet. And we're hopefully can bring back the ocean and also use this to bring people together about issues related to plastic. Something we can all make a difference in. Unlike carbon, we can see it, touch it. A child knows where it is on the street. And instead of just being carbon neutral or plastic neutral, it's time now to really be positive and bring, give the stuff back, as you heard today in all different social aspects. Give it back. So if you see one thing, you can pick up one, now you're neutral. But why don't you pick up 10 or 20 pieces and start really giving some value back. Just on a daily basis, that's something you can do when you think about what your plastic footprint is. Do you need that? Do you need that extra packaging? So I'd love to, um, you know, the speak speakers today were great. And when you think about what everyone's doing, and I think the, the candlelight exhibit is great as well, that um, everyone here probably has that flame burning. And there's, this really proves that there's a good, the Ethiopian proverb that says, when spider webs unite, they can even halt a lion. And I think all of us here can do that. Thank you.